No one could bear our sins but him alone. And we begin to see at that moment, we have to speculate because scripture never really says this, but we have to speculate, but it seems at that point, that's where he, he experienced that all of our sin was placed on him. All of it. Not just my sin, not just your sin, but the sins of everyone from the beginning, from Adam all the way to whenever history is completed. Every sin placed on him. And he begins to collapse as a human, as a physical being. He collapses under the pressure. And there's something else I think is taking place at this point is that it's beginning to seem to him that God is rather far away. And remember when he's on the cross, the first thing that he said was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Imagine the pressure. Now, I've been, a, I've been a Christian for a while. I cannot imagine, truly imagine, the condition of what would it be like to not be able to sense God? What would that be like? Can you imagine the emptiness? Lonely does not catch it. We know that people give up their life because they're lonely. Probably, I don't really know this, but is probably the biggest cause of depression and probably the biggest cause of suicide the most fundamental human drive, even more than survival, even more than survival, is to be attached in an emotionally safe relationship. And for Jesus, all that evaporated. Imagine what that was like. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. What's the cup? What is he talking about? Death. The crucifixion. The trials. The beating. The humiliation. He was beaten to the place that he could no longer be recognized. Josephus tells us this. Isaiah predicts it, but Josephus confirms it. People that saw the crucifixion confirmed this. It's it's stunning. And he's saying... If you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Can you, is is it hard for us to imagine that a man would be suffering under this kind of load and would ask for deliverance, would ask for salvation from this, rescue from this? Does that make sense? Of course, any human being would. But here again, as a man, he speaks under that pressure, under that agony, and he reaches out to his father that I'm not sure he could feel anymore. The one he walked with for comfort and and companionship and understanding, the one he could entrust himself to always, who doesn't seem to be there. And all this crushing weight of guilt that he had nothing to do with. Verse 43, now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. He said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. I guess they were good sleepers. But there's this loud praying. He prayed fervently. He prayed with depth. He prayed with agony. There are those times in our life when we pray and we mean it. It goes deeper than we can express. We don't know how to put those things into words. 
And we can be grateful that the Spirit prays on our behalf to the Father because we don't know how to pray as we should, and He prays with groanings too deep for words. So He'll translate for us. He will take what's important and make it and kind of usher our prayer into the presence of God. Even there, God is the only one standing between us and Himself. This is a prayer for deliverance from His death. But it's interesting. First John tells us that if we know that God hears our prayer, then we know that we will have the petition that we are asking for, right? You know that verse? This is what he says. And so here's Jesus. He's praying to the Father. When did we see the Father not answer any prayer? Well, that's curious, isn't it? And yet we know the story. We know what played out. Jesus went to the cross. He suffered all these things. We'll get to this in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of this here. But Jesus' prayer is answered. It's answered for him. And because it was answered for him in this unusual way, it's answered for you. That prayer wasn't just answered for Jesus, it was answered for you. This prayer that he would be delivered from death was answered for you. How did he answer that? When Jesus died for your sin, how much of your sin was paid for? All of it. That should be an easy question. All of your sin was paid for Therefore, will you be judged? No. On what basis? It's all paid for. It's all paid for. Hallelujah. We have a wonderful Savior. That should be one of the most relieving statements. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus. What part of no don't you understand? No condemnation. Truly, you know this one too. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. 